Can you, so you can see my screen? Yes, ma'am. If you want to go on to the, the statement that, and I'll read that while you um, finish taking attendance. So as y'all know, we read this every time um, in advance of starting our meetings, uh, the fiscal responsibility subcommittee. So the Tennessee Department of Education is excited to work with you on this opportunity to discuss the state's formula for funding public education. Before we begin, the department would like to remind you of the following. <clears throat> Conversations on this topic are not intended to reflect on the current BEP funding formula. The current BEP formula will remain in place until a new formula is recommended to and approved by the Tennessee General Assembly. The public is encouraged to submit comments in writing to ensure that all communications are just there we go. So that all communications are thoroughly documented and can be reviewed and considered in the future. Public comment is encouraged to focus on developing a new funding formula rather than revising the current funding formula. Consider what should be funded in a new funding formula and at what level. Subcommittees will be responsible for reviewing public comment and making recommendations for what should be included in the new funding formula. While all subcommittee or committees, subcommittees and members of the public should feel free to communicate openly Documents and records may be subject to public inspection pursuant to the Tennessee Public Records Act and may be publicly posted or otherwise made available. And finally, all recommendations that are submitted by committees and subcommittees will be reviewed and considered, but not all recommendations will ultimately be included in the proposed new funding formula. Any questions about that? Anything you need, Dominique, before we get started? Let me just make sure I have captured everybody in attendance. I have Justin, Harry, Jim, David, Kate, Karen, Catherine, Tara, and Michael. Is there anyone on that I've not, I'm not seeing? All right. Well, thank you all for being on our committee call today, despite the weather. Hope you're staying warm out there. A few, few notes just to give you an overview of, of today's agenda. There are a couple of things that we really need to get done from a timing perspective. Uh, and, and Dominique will be reporting our discussion today back to the department as they finalize an initial draft proposal. And so the two big things that I want us to cover today are discussing the base and what should be included in that base funding formula. So that is the set amount that each child gets across the state, no matter what. What are the things we want to be included in that and we'll offer those recommendations to um, to the department uh, after today's call? And then the second thing I'd like us to wrap up today is our discussion on the weights. We got pretty far along in the last meeting in determining what needs to be in the must haves versus should haves and other buckets. We've got a few items that we want to discuss further to finalize our um, recommendations on that. And then if we have time today, we can get into those next two categories uh, in that pyramid, if you'll recall, which will be direct funding and then outcomes funding. Uh, just a couple of other notes as, as we consider uh, our discussion today. Um, we should see a draft formula, an initial draft formula from the department in advance of our next meeting on the 18th. So there might be some things that um, get brought up today that, that I may ask you, can we wait until the 18th to discuss that once we've seen that initial draft because it may make more sense in context uh, of that initial draft formula. And then the, the policy goals, you know, guardrails, policy goals, things like transparency and accountability, those things are going to be discussed at the next meeting uh, as well so that we can really flesh those out. So um, what I'd like to do today is really drill down on the base, what should be included in the base, and then finish our discussion on prioritizing uh, the weights. Does that make sense to everybody? If you will, Dominique, go to that base. Um, real quick, this is a good, if, if you'll stay on that slide. Sorry to keep you bouncing around. Um, the the slide about must have, should have. So just a reminder, as we're looking at each of these categories, 
we want to prioritize them for the department based off what we think must be included in the base or must be included in the weights. Next would be should haves. These are things that should be a priority, but aren't necessarily absolute in terms of must be included. And then things beyond that uh, that are more pie in the sky would be nice to have this or a long shot, throw a Hail Mary and put those in. So as we discuss each of these items in the base and in the weights, we'll want to rank them in terms of at least the must haves and the should haves. Uh, and then also if we have others um, in those nice, nice to have and long shot categories. So let's go to the base slide. So we didn't discuss this too much. Um, we, we've discussed these issues generally. I know some of you have submitted some feedback on this, um, but we haven't delved into what specifically we would recommend as a subcommittee be included in the base funding. Here is a slide from the department that gives some uh, examples of things that they're discussing or that other subcommittees have discussed or that have been brought up as part of the public review period. And so I'd like to, it might make sense to just talk through each of these. And then again, I know some of you have uh, suggested some, some things that you'd like to discuss inclusion into the base funding. Remember, this is the flat fee that or flat uh, payment that is made per student uh, to each district based off the number of students uh, in, in that district. And so here are a, a few examples. Nurses, obviously, on here, counselors and school psychologists, teacher salary benefits, technology, and then some other things, principals and assistant principals, uh, financial literacy and things like that. So anything that is on here that you would suggest um, may not fit in the base so that we can make this as narrow as possible in terms of what we want to be included and then uh, discuss prioritizing those things. Justin, this is Dave Perdue. Uh, I know you had some, some, you submitted yeah, some. I don't know comments. that I would include counselors and school psychologists. Those seem to be a uh, handicap to me. Okay, others got thoughts on that? Just a couple of items, uh, Justin, that we need to, as per state law, we probably need to be, to be technical, say, you know, the director of schools. Uh, technically speaking, according to state law, we've got to look at uh, security. Uh, we have to look at um, some specialized um, uh, with the uh, CTE and things of that nature as well. Uh, but obviously, you know, and I think it needs to be predicated on per building. The old uh, BEP was predicated on if you had X number of students, you would have X number of teachers or uh, whatever the different category was. But in this new approach, we probably have to specify in code that you must hire using these dollars of uh, the list. And we may need to set within the list a ratio uh, for educators. And because uh, the ratio for CTE by law is different than for the general classroom. So as we specifically go down through there, like I think librarian, uh, I think is mentioned in the code and uh, Technology is another item that we've dealt with over the years in a funding standpoint, and we require testing. So therefore, we've got to specify expenditures in regard to testing and testing preparation, because uh, those are things that are required by law. I think and, it might be good to, because uh, we talked about that regarding the weights as well, uh, in our recommendations to have that catch-all category in the base of anything that's that's mandated by state law unless those mandates are are lifted i think that yeah makes a lot well, of that sense. might be the best way to summarize it okay if it's mandated because it's mandated okay. that we teach a certain course or class you know in in some of the the curriculum so that that has an impact on what the money has to be spent toward as well 
I also wanted to add up um, just a reminder of something that the commissioner talked about. I can't remember if it was in the video or in the chair's meeting, but anything that is currently funded inside the BEP or outside of the BEP is still going to be funded. So that is just a, something I wanted to, to throw in here to let you know. And then you can just tell me what you want me to capture on this recommendations document from the conversation that you just and that's a good point, and, and I'll reiterate that, that the, the commissioner has said that a couple of times to us now, that if it's funded now, uh, it will remain funded. I think the, the question becomes, in which of the categories do we recommend it be funded? So, for example, um, going back to, to David's point about counselors, that could potentially be a direct funding uh, place. It's not categorized in the base, but we're going to say that we want each school to have a counselor uh, or a school psychologist and can provide direct funding on top of that base and on top of the weights uh, as well. So that that might be something that makes sense to be um, recommended as a as a direct funding rather than as part of the the per pupil base. I know I see I think Michael was the first uh, with his hand up. Michael, do you want to chime in? Yeah, yeah. So uh, a couple of thoughts. One, Justin, I think some of the some of what's required by law to be funded need not be in the base to your point. So I think we could specify that some items will go under direct funding because we have we have the base, we have the weights attached to the base. Uh, we may have outcome based dollars, but then we also have direct funding. And so I think some things mandated by law can be not in the base, but still funded. Um, and I think that's an important distinction. Um, the second thing is for the base, I, I did have some thoughts on what could be included in there. And then third, just um, some some way to specify how, how we're funding the base. So. So in the base, I think it's clear that we want educators, we want district and building leadership. I think that's kind of one category. The second is in the category of like counselors and psychologists, nurses, and what's labeled here as SROs, school resource officers, you know, the kind of law enforcement. Those, th th those two buckets, educators, district building leadership, and then the other bucket of counselor psychologists, nurses, school resource officers, those kind of across states are pretty consistently in the base. Um, and then the other category, I think, would be facilities and maintenance, technological infrastructure, and transportation. And those are also pretty consistently in the base. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Like, we can look at other states. I look especially to Florida, some others. That's in there. And then final thought, because I know a bunch of others are lining up. Um, I think we can bracket and come back for discussion on uh, exactly how we will include educators in there. So, so some states, there's a debate on how you uh, calculate educator funding. So teacher salary and benefits. Most states use just average kind of across the board. And then another thing to come back to is um, how we calculate the number of students in the base funding. So how we calculate the full-time equivalent number of students, I think will be an important discussion. And even what full-time equivalent level of instruction means, and then over what, when we measure the number of students. Uh, and I, I think that's important. One final thing is some states, rather than putting in the weight, they'll they'll adjust the base by district cost differential. So they'll they'll say like these places have higher prices on average, like it's more expensive in Nashville. So we will adjust the base a little bit. It's separate from a weight. It's not a classic weight, but the base will be adjusted by by the, the price differences um, between districts. And with that. That's my input. All right, I think I've called all of those notes. Um, Tara, I think you were next uh, next in line. 
Sure. Thanks. I'm trying to think of it as things that aren't already captured in the BEP because I had my list and that was a good reminder. So thank you. One of the things it says technology sustainability and in our discussions, we're thinking of technology as textbooks as well, because so much of student resources are going online. Um, just something to consider is the one to one that I think most districts are at now for technology needs. I, I look at sustainability and I guess I would want to know what that means. Does that mean that it's reasonable that a district updates their device every three years for every student, like some sort of cycle update, that kind of cost? And then the cost of textbooks, thinking it, thinking of it from the traditional paperback version we're used to, is there a difference in cost as we're transitioning more to online resources? I just some sort of acknowledgement of that cost as well. And with that, I think that lends to um, district support positions that are not school specific, but right now the BEP, I know we don't necessarily capture like instructional support or IT. Um, I know we have a, I think IT coordinators, but I'm thinking more of like district support, just seeing through COVID all of the, the infrastructure we had to get up and going to support students for virtual learning. There is now an expectation of a lot more online. So district IT, and then other positions that are necessary for the running of a school district are HR, you know, payroll, those kinds of things, and finance. Um, we are going to be giving districts a lot more money. And with that may come additional reporting requirements. We need to make sure that districts have the finance uh, support staff to handle that with whatever expenditure reporting comes with it. So. Very helpful feedback. Thank you. Um, Karen, I believe you're next. Well, to echo what, exactly what the others have said, we just need to be sure that in doing the base that we include what has been left out of the VEP, and that would be assistant principals, a principal for every building, school finance, uh, the technology sustainability, I would think technology now would par parallel what you do with textbooks. We have a seven year cycle now on textbooks. And I think probably as we develop this new formula, there needs to be a cycle for technology. It could be grade levels, technology based. Um, I talked with some of our IT folks across the state. And the thing that I heard was is that the life cycle of technology is three to five years. So that type of cycle needs to be incorporated in our sustainability. Then again, on the capital needs, we could possibly set up a staged capital of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, in past years in the past, we have uh, established a report that we do on, on did on facilities, on square footage. Every school system is unique, but if we had a standardized formula, that could be incorporated into a capital needs portion of the formula. And I think that needs to be looked at. Thank you so much, David. Yes, sir. I, I'm a little puzzled by the statement that everything that's in the been previously funded will continue to be so. Uh, does that not uh, mean that all we're going to do is add to the cost? Uh, so I'm a little puzzled by that statement. Can you clarify that for us, Justin? Yeah, I think what the commissioner was saying is that all the categories of funding that have been funded will be continued to do so. They may just be funded differently. And so when you move to a student based model, you will find the opportunity for some cost savings in some areas. Other things will potentially cost more. Um, but as you put as you drive those dollars down to the school level and give schools more flexibility in exchange for accountability, they may find ways to reduce costs of certain programs. Uh, and so you're, you're not just necessarily adding. But I think the point was 
that if there is a category or a program that is currently being funded, then it will be included. It will not be cut. And so um, the, the concerns that we're going to start from scratch aren't necessarily the case. We're just going to to fund differently with different incentives. Does that make sense? Well, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I think I'm still trying to digest it all, but uh, it really looks to me like that all we're going to be doing is adding cost. I don't see how you can adopt the principle that everything that's currently funded will continue to be funded in the future and then say there should be some opportunities to eliminate some cost. I, I just don't see how those statements uh, reconcile with each other. Potentially, as we see the, the draft uh, from the department that, that outlines where they're headed with the formula based on the feedback they've seen, that we can can have that discussion at the next meeting because we should have seen that and have a better ex understanding of the direction they're headed uh, when it comes to that. I do think we've seen other states uh, that have moved to a student-based model because they've given the, you know, they've, they've driven decisions down to the local leadership and eliminated some of the mandates. If you're just, you're incentivizing better prior prioritization of spending, which can over the, the long haul uh, reduce the cost in certain types of programs, reduce the cost in certain areas that they find new ways to do things that aren't as costly because they then have an incentive to use those dollars more wisely because they're not just told, here's $5, you have to spend it on X, if that makes sense. Well, uh, in thinking about the base amount, uh, should we not state that the base is to uh, make sure that reading, writing, and arithmetic and the arts are included in, in, every, uh, in every school system? Do we not need to state that? I think it's fair to state that's the, the most fundamental the piece of education and that should be and especially as we look at um, once we start to prioritize these base allocations to the must haves, I think that would probably be number one, right? Other than maybe looking at teacher salary benefits because that's the number one um, number one educator. Uh, in the in the schools that those basic fundamental things must be funded uh, as part of that base reading writing arithmetic and you mentioned arts as well okay thank you Kate I believe you're next thank you um I, I just want to clarify something Dominique said that things that are outside the BEP will now be inside the BEP like charter facilities funding is that my understanding it's all going to be folded into the BEP? So the BEP will be replaced by a new, entirely new formula. Okay. And, and I think the, the, the plan would be to continue to include those things in funding. They're not currently inside the BEP, but they're funded separately to include those in the overall funding formula, either as base, weight, direct, or outcomes funding in one of those categories. Okay. So everything's going to be folded into this new. Right. Bring it all together into one comprehensive funding model. That's my understanding. Rather than have the BEP here, plus these other things that are added onto that, kind of like a Christmas tree approach, where you're just adding, hanging different things onto it. Okay. And then sections like technology sustainability do we give more direct input on because i i think our technology um we need more i think tara is the one that said that there needs to be more education on how to use it and also if you're having increased reporting you need better computer systems to do it better programs because a lot of the programs i see from the state level are super time consuming so under sustainability, I would also say that are reporting tools. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think one thing we can do, uh, Dominique, when, in our feedback to the department today is to potentially ask questions about what, 
what they're thinking technology sustainability means. And then we suggest that you include reviewing the cycles as as Karen mentioned, um, you know, that cycle will change as we move more towards technology. It's probably cheaper to buy electronic books and online books than physical hard copies, but you're going to need to update those more often than the seven years that we currently are. And then um, I forget who mentioned, but the district support for IT, I think that might have been Tara, it, it, like you're saying, Kate, make sure that there is a support system to go through that process on the IT side and report back so that we're we're ensuring that if we're going to have accountability that it it's an easy process to report back how those dollars are being spent and we're not wasting dollars on a complicated or outdated reporting system as well i think all of those things should be brought to the department's attention from a sustainability standpoint chris i believe you're next um i may not need to say anything i think david purdue kind of echoed largely what I was thinking, and that is just a philosophical approach to all of this. Um, if we're just trying to find out a new way to preserve the status quo, we're not going to accomplish any good. Um, that's that's the summary. You guys got you it. Guys just, so just to <laughs> throw that out there, our parents' perspective, certainly that is something that's important, is shaking up how things are done, because frankly, it's not working. So preserving the status quo is not the goal here. It's something better. Very good point. Chairman Brooks, I believe you're next. A couple of observations. Uh, philosophically, one of the changes that we need to seriously recommend and consider is to rather than sending concepts and monies and packages to LEAs, we need to, in some ways, break it down to a school building that in, in the minimum must have standards that every school building ought to have A through K or whatever, uh, could be A through Z. Uh, that, that I think is a fundamental difference in what we have been doing. Uh, we've been looking at it, lumping it, saying that X number of students go over here and therefore you get, you can multiply it out and find you have two and a half principles. Well, if you've got three buildings, you need three principles. Uh, so I think fundamentally, uh, we need to look at that concept seriously. And that would determine uh, a significant amount of funding change. Because uh, then you've got a minimum of a principal and assistant principal in, in a building. Because you need one of each, given today's, today's demands in reference to just that building of leadership and the assistant would be a new kind of approach to the current philosophy. Uh, but, but that, that's a major shift if we move to the per building and, uh, you know, there's items as we get into that, uh, waiting when we get into the next section of discussion, but, uh, it's going to be a tough road. We ultimately, uh, the state's going to need to be looking at some additional dollars. Uh, I believe we have maxed out our uh, kind of, you know, our, our outcomes based on dollars spent. Uh, we, we, we are getting phenomenal outcomes for the dollar input. Uh, haven't re regrafted those state by state analysis of dollar input and outcome comparisons in a you know, you know, a major kind of uh, graft, but I think we're at the point that we need to pump more money and that would be into salaries, supplies and benefits and, and also with the uh, classroom uh, dollars. And uh, uh, that, that ultimately will, will be a determining factor. If we, if we want to grow outcome wise beyond where we are, I believe we're at that point that we just need to begin looking seriously. And a lot of that goes to salaries uh, and uh, to retain and to bring on some quality educators. 
Yeah, I think some of those things we could look at, uh, we'll revisit that when we talk about the direct funding and outcomes. I think something else was brought up earlier about um, capital projects to, you, some of those things could be looked at in the direct funding category that we want each school to have X or that we're gonna give capital funding as a direct funding rather than on the per pupil basis uh, above and beyond that that base in weights. Um, so, so we'll certainly, let's plan to revisit that, some of those items when we talk about the direct funding as well. Tara, I think you were next. I'd like to speak to the idea of maintaining everything that's in the current BEP. Um, public feedback from, you know, families, parents, teachers, school districts themselves have all consistently shown that the current level of funding is insufficient to meet state requirements. For example, the current level of funding of the BEP does not mean that districts can hire enough teachers within their BEP funding to meet class size ratios. Almost every single district across the state hires above and beyond from their BEP funding, which means that they're paying for those positions with 100% local funds. So the current level of funding is not even meeting what is in the state law or state board of education policies or rules right now. And so I would just that's an important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about just quote unquote, just giving more money. The money currently is not meeting state requirements. So I understand the inclination to want to get an ROI on money that we are giving, which I think can be talked about, but the current level is insufficient. Thanks, that's all. Thank you, Michael. I think one of the biggest problems is even as we have increased funding to education in Tennessee, not enough of that money has been going into the classrooms and there's not enough flexibility for teachers to be able to teach well with the dollars that they have. I, I would say that this this whole debate around this, the, the formula is at present, though, not about how much money to give, but how we can better spend the money that we have so that when we do potentially near term future debate whether to give more money, that we spend it in the right way, that that money does actually get into the classroom. And I think that's a big part of why we're here today. So to, to that end, uh, I think that we want to make sure that the base is flexible, that teachers and schools are, are, are given flexibility um, to listen to what their students, be responsive to what students really need, what parents are saying they need, what teachers are saying they need. And so, you know, I, I think that we have a lot of great ideas of what individual, each individual school should have, you know, whether they should have a set level of staff and they should have these particular roles in every single school. Those are all great ideas. But I think in the base, we need to allow flexibility have have broad categories. So here on this slide, we have a broad category of school-based supports. Make sure that that is considered in the base and then give each school the flexibility to figure out exactly what they need when it comes to say counselors or what is needed when it comes to technology. I think that's that's key. So as long as we make sure that we have the right categories in this base, I think we're good and I think we're we're fitting the mission of, of this uh, formula revision. Perhaps that is the best way to look at it. And, and some of the points you made, we're gonna revisit um, in the next meeting when we discuss the policy priorities. And, and I think that's where we as a, as a subcommittee with our role looking at fiscal responsibility, are we getting the, the best uh, that we can get for, for children and, and for, parents, for educators, for taxpayers, what are those policy recommendations? I think your point to the flexibility, that's where we're going to get innovation. That's where we're going to have uh, individual districts and individual schools coming up with new and better ways to do things. And going back to David's point, I think that's where you can find some cost savings because you can find that funding 
this at, um, you know, 80 cents on the dollar gets a better result than funding what we did at, at the full 100%. And so uh, I want to definitely come back to that point when we get to the, the discussion around policy at the next meeting, because I think these items are going to all the subcommittees are going to be offering various recommendations about what's in the base, what's in the weights and those things. We obviously want to give our feedback as a as a subcommittee to those things. But I think a valid point potentially for us is to really think about what are those policy priorities, because we're probably going to as a subcommittee have more specific policy priorities on the whole funding formula, whereas some of the others are specific to their issue area. And then along those lines, as we're looking at the base, like you said, what are, let's not get too specific because the more specific we get, the more we fall back into the same boat that we're in where you're driving state mandates down to the districts and then down to the schools and not give them flexibility. And that is at odds with the concept of a student based approach that in, in Tara, I know you have some good perspective on this at MNPS, which already does uh, a student based approach uh, more so than any other district in the state. I think um, so much more of those dollars go directly to schools and for school leaders to decide what to do with than what we see in, in most cases. I think in MNPS, it's over 50, over 50% 50 of those dollars where our research at Beacon showed that for an average principal across the state, it's more like 8% that they have control over because so many of those dollars are dictated down to them how they have to be spent specifically. And in exchange for that flexibility, you can have accountability on the back end and rather than mandates on the front end and a one size fits all approach. So maybe we look at this through that that lens. These are, are there a way to re recommend to the department certain broad categories that we say must be included in the base without getting too specific about how those dollars have to be spent in each individual school? Is that something that the group thinks we we can head in that direction, Tara? I think that's a really good idea. I guess the technical question that comes up is just how do we determine what level of funding is sufficient? It's really hard for us to conceptualize school support, you know, technology. Well, we have to back into that number somehow. And most of us are operating from the numbers we're getting already from the BEP, which is, okay, we get X amount of dollars, which is based on one position per 200 students. So that it's really hard to just say a, there should be funding for this broad category unless we can say, what does that category actually cover? Okay, instructional materials covers textbooks and technology and technology updated every three years and district support technology positions and actual infrastructure materials. We have to tie a cost to that in order to say this is a sufficient level of base funding as well. It's one thing to just talk about all the things that should be included, but we have to be able to tie a dollar amount to that at some point. So I'm gonna give a little bit of information. Let me pull something up to, to read that is happening right now. Um, districts have been given a, a district funding questionnaire to go along with, you know, as as all of the subcommittees are are exploring this, and this the survey is broken down into positions at the school level, at the district level, and they are they are inputting average spend um, targets, target rate, you know, different pieces of that that I guess will in later in the process come into play for the costing and calculation of the funding. So they're gathering that from districts all across the state. Do we know when we might get the results of that back? Um, I know that I, I think that they are due tomorrow, that the surveys are supposed to be completed by the districts tomorrow. But no, I don't know anything about 
what will then be done with that information as soon as it's gathered. But that Very is a good. process that's taking place. Very good to know. Uh, Chairman Brooks. Before we leave this area of discussion, uh, one of the things I think we need to, we've got to include, in my opinion, in the process of, um, you know, physical responsibility, we have to examine and look at uh, the uh, local ability to pay, uh, the Tasser and Fox uh, analysis of uh, that local capacity. Uh, there, you know, no matter what we set up, if we maintain that current um, concept, uh, then we're, we're going to develop some difficulties. No matter how we, if we go to a student based and then putting the money back into the building and management of those dollars within that building. Uh, but we still have that a big question that's out there, uh, that that local ability to fund. And, and, and one of the thoughts is that we need within that concept to develop a basement, you know, because, you know, currently I, I think we have some outliers uh, within the within the process uh, that, that we need to address. I think it's got to be something we need to do. And, and it could be that that if the basement is developed, that could very well be a, a significant financial uh, consideration, because if we were to say a base of 52 percent, you know, and uh, you know, let that be the, you know, the state percentage, regardless of where you fall, and that the analysis of those local ability to pay ought to be with the LEAs not with just the county because if, if you just look at the county then then you're going to be looking at let's say what McMinn County versus Athens you'd be looking at you know uh, from the standpoint of uh, Blount County versus Maryland Alcoa I think we've got to go back to the LEA and deal with those local ability to pay because each one of those LEAs have their own tax base what's you know, LEA mean a local educational authority like the Maryville City School System, Blount County School System, uh, Athens School System versus McMinn County School System. And uh, uh, those two concepts within the current uh, process of determining local ability to pay, uh, we've, we've got to address that. If, if we don't address that, we're still going to have some arguments, concerns, and probably some legitimacy for lawsuits uh, in reference to uh, not not sort of sort of dealing with that as well we have a chance to deal with it we might get some answers to to that when we get the the draft formula that the the, the department is working on so let let's see what that looks like and then have have that discussion at the next meeting because I think that might give us a picture of, okay, how do we address that piece based off where we're headed with the, with the draft, with the first draft outline. And I will add that they have been holding meetings all across the state with districts and their local funding bodies gathering feedback. So the local funding piece is being handled um, and they're, they're getting feedback in a separate space. Good, good. Those recordings are on the website too, if anybody is interested in in seeing what has transpired in those. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, so uh, Justin, to your question on should we be focusing on broad categories? Yes, completely agree. Um, I would add one other thing though. So I think fiscal responsibility, ensuring that we get fiscal responsibility also comes down to us having a sense of how we measure what goes into the base or what the weight is. So that's not to say that we discuss how much money should go into the base. That doesn't mean that we decide, and this isn't actually within the scope of our committee, but it's not that we decide what the exact weight should be, the number should be for a particular weight. But I think some discussion of how we, how we come to the determination, say, of the number of students in the first place, I think will be a good check on on 
on fiscal accountability. So, so for instance, like during the pandemic, there's been in many states that have student-centered funding formula, a big debate about how exactly you calculate students, because if it's about attendance, average attendance, um, that may look very different during a pandemic. Suddenly the, these questions have mattered a lot. Um, so uh, I have ideas on that, but I at least want to say how, how we measure these things, I think is a big part of um, fiscal responsibility. And then since we are talking about this slide as well and what should go into the base, I would, I don't want to forget this, I do want to push back on a couple of uh, pieces mentioned here. So I, I'm not sure if, things like RTI squared should be under the base, similar for middle school CTE or financial literacy. I would suggest including those under the category of what we do direct funding for. So these are allocations for specific programs and something like response to instruction intervention RTI. This is like a Tennessee specific program that we can say we're going to allocate specific dollars for that. Similarly, like we could allocate specific dollars for CTE, for financial literacy, put that under the broad category of vocational programs. Um, I think traditionally that's been kind of funded as its own specific thing. I'm not sure that really goes in under the base or I, I checked other states. Traditionally, these things I don't think are included in the base either in other states as well. Uh, unlike principles, assistant principles, SROs, things like that. Those are traditional part of the base. I think it's a good point too, because some of those things will be very different depending on the district. Some districts will have high need for CTE, others won't. And so if you include those in the base, you potentially are robbing some districts of the resources they need and giving it to another district that needs that for something else. And so potentially, uh, a recommendation might be to include some of those things in direct funding. It's not saying that we're not funding them, but we're funding them more as a grant program or a direct basis based on the need of the district or the individual school rather than in the base that every child in the state gets and a percentage of their dollars that we're giving to that student then go towards those things that that student in that school in that district may not need. So that's something that we we might want to recommend back to the to the department that I think those two in particular you mentioned RTI squared and middle school C CTE to me make more sense in a direct funding uh, category than in a base um, across the board. Any other thoughts on these specific things here that you say should not be listed? Another one might be. Um, there might be some disagreement on this, but I think David, you mentioned that the, the counselor's line item, potentially that's also something that's looked at more as a direct funding, uh, that we're gonna have one in each school or whatever that, that that is, that's not necessarily in a base that would, would some larger schools would get more funding, others, you know, smaller schools may not have enough in that case to hire a counselor uh, you know, a direct funding of stuff like that might level that out a little bit better. Kate? So when you have the, the base, are you required to fund all of those things? So you have to have a nurse, a counselor. When it's in the base, does that mean it's required and you really don't have flexibility? It, if you say, you know, that base funding is for, you know, X number of ratio teachers, X number of ratio nurses, counselors, those things. Yes, I think when it's in the base, then it becomes more of a mandate for every single school across the state, whereas that direct funding bucket can be above and beyond the base, but be flexible in terms of how much each school gets in, based on its, its needs. Okay. Hmm. Karen? My concern about taking those items out are that there are districts that are not fortunate enough to even be able to think in the direction of a middle school CTE program or maybe even an RTI program. Their school district needs them, but if they're not incorporated somewhere within the base of the formula, they're not going to be considered. Whenever you go outside to outside direct funding, 
uh, speaking from a financial standpoint, you get the basics and what is in that base will be considered the basics and many school districts do not ever get to venture out past the base. I think the goal would be that all of these levels, just like with weights, that you're going to get that funding. Uh, it's just funded in a lump sum rather than as a but, per pupil percentage. And of again, I don't know how they're going to calculate the base, but I would assume there's going to have to be some kind of dollar figure associated with the component. And so I would, for one, think that they, any of these items that we consider basic education would be left in the bag. School district chooses to use their base money for something else. At least the thought has been planted that this is what it was for. And again, going back to the local support, many times that even if when you have, let's say that there's a raise or there's salary increases, if it, the local has to put up 30 or 40 percent of that salary increase, then that pulls away from these extra niceties that are even in the formula. So again, we've just got to be sure that we get in that base a calculation of everything that we really want a student to have in education, or we want the state of Tennessee to fund for education. Harry? Just a comment about, uh, add to what Karen was saying. I've had a number of uh, directors of schools call me over the years and say, don't give us a pay increase for salaries. I, I can't afford it. I mean, I'm going to lose two positions in high school because of it. So I think what Karen is saying, that local ability to pay, we've got to address that within the scope of fiscal responsibility. We can't create a system or maintain a system that says, we're going to send money to Clay County or to Hancock County, and, and lo and behold, you're going to have to do a pay increase for salaries. And then you wind up saying, well, we're going to lose the counselor in the middle school. We're going to lose the, uh, the art teacher in high school. We're going to lose, we're going to grow the class size in science in high school. You know, so the, the two work together. You know, if fiscal responsibility must include or should include uh, the uh, uh, local ability to pay uh, because the two, if, if they're in conflict with each other, uh, it creates some serious uh, problems, some serious difficulties. Barry, how do you measure the local ability to pay? Th that is a, a methodology that was set up with uh, TASSER. Uh, that is a uh, organization that works with local governments in regard to the financial process and with the analysis that Dr. Fox has done in regard to um, uh, their, his measuring, his staff's measuring of the local ability from the standpoint of tax base and sales tax and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a detailed kind of calculation uh, from that standpoint. The, uh, if, you, if you look at it, uh, I guess, Karen, you might know better what school systems are below the 50%? There are two school districts right now that are below 50%. That's Davidson County and Sevier County. And the, what puts those districts below the 50% is, is that they are the, on the Siebert formula, which is the Dr. Fox formula, it measures per capita sales tax and per capita property tax. In a, in a place like Sevier County, which makes Sevier County an outline, you can't take 99,000 people and divide it into a sales tax generated by 11 million people and assume that those 99,000 people have the ability to pay that much sales tax or that much property tax. So on the task formula, there are seven components which consider everything from property, assessed values of the property, to the sales tax, to per capita income, to the differential between commercial and uh, 
percentage. And residential properties. And all of those components, and it's a very complex factor, but the one thing that is left out of the formula right now calculating the um, fiscal capacity is the overhead cost. And again, I can only speak for Sevier County and, and possibly for Davidson and also maybe for Shelby that if you have a tourism-based economy, every night you have 250,000 people sleeping there that are not tax-paying citizens that you have to provide services for. And so that's one of the things that is now skewering the physical capacity. If you live in, a, if you are in a city school district, you receive city property taxes. You also receive a pro rata part of the, of the county property taxes and the sales tax that you get to stand under the umbrella of the county's economic uh, poverty level. So this is the thing that needs to be studied most is that fiscal capacity because that's the complexity where we have the problem in our formula. And I, I think if we could get that piece of the puzzle fixed, we could fix the equity side of it and then we could start working on adequacy. Let's see if when, when we get the, the draft from the department, if that helps give us some, some context on, <laughs> on the local piece. And I'm not really sure that, that that will be a piece that will be included between now and then, because like I said, that's a separate process that's taking place right now. Right. Um, I will definitely in my feedback say that you know this this committee feels like there should be a space for that in discussion but um that's taking I know that's taking place separately and possibly I can see if someone like Sam Piercy or somebody can come and speak to that at the next meeting for you all that might be helpful just to so we don't you know we want to see how that ties into everything together while still making sure that the recommendations that we're making get considered in a timely manner uh, as they're looking at the these buckets of the categories of, of base weights um, direct and, and outcomes i know we're going over just a little bit um, it, we can take a few more minutes if that's okay michael do you have have something yeah lo local ability to pay incredibly important i think through student-centered funding formula, ideally the weights uh, will help, will be responsive to those local needs. So I know that we didn't get to weights this time around, but having something about district characteristics, whether it's rural and sparse or fast growing, having some adaptability for grade level, K through third, nine through 12, um, and then potentially adjusting the base even by local prices, local cost of goods and pay uh, locally, that can help ideally be responsive to local needs. I think what we wanna be careful of is uh, a focus on local ability to pay, getting us right back to the current status quo of a resource-based approach. I think we wanna put the student-centered formula first. We wanna put students first and then through the right weights, make sure that the money that is spent is actually adapted to not just students, but to the communities that they live in. Um, and whether they are low income or not, that, that money is appropriately weighted to account for that. If we can go quickly to the weight slide before we get off, I, we got pretty far along on that last time. I know there's still some discussion here going on about the the base and, and what's included or not, but pretty much everything that that's on this slide we discussed um, in the last last discussion. I think we probably had discussed more the the rural and sparsity kind of being tied together in a way, um, and but but being included. And uh, looking at my notes, I don't see anything else. The only other piece that we had discussed as a weight was CTE. And, and I think we also discussed even then that that might be more appropriately a direct funding uh, piece um, in, instead of a weight. But 
any other thoughts on this particular slide so that we can can offer that final recommendation to the to the um, department about these particular the, the list of these particular weights kate kate are you there sorry, She's on. i was muted oh, sorry about um, that. no my my fault um charter enrollment um i do hope that we include that in the weight because it does give you um a lot of flexibility as a charter to change things rapidly which i think is helpful for all public schools and also your uh outcomes are judged pretty quickly so if you're failing you're closed very good point chairman brooks one of the things as we determine weights, we want to make sure that we set it up to where it's not gamed, that, that it's an accurate reflection. For example, the uh, the title, I guess it may be Title I monies that come from the feds. Their requirement to create that is just someone saying, yes, uh, I'm below a certain level. Um, and I know that in some communities, there's a lot of folks that will not signed a document saying that they want their son or daughter to have free lunches. You know, that, that's just an ethical, that's something they believe they're not going to do. So it may not reflect the economic disadvantage, but there's one key that if we're looking at a student-based outcome-based program where we could plug in extra money that would take care of some of the economic disadvantage would be the RTI squared. Because if you're looking at outcomes, and if you see there's some difficulty in a particular uh, LEA, then you need to move more RTI money there. Uh, and that could be as a result of certain economic disadvantages. That could be a result of, you know, second language issues. Uh, but I think philosophically, if we're after outcome, then uh, then we need to look at you know weighting or direct funding that uh, intervention program uh, from that standpoint. Uh, but however we whatever we set up, let's set it up in such a fashion that we're not going to spend hours in lawsuits arguing whether or not. You know, there's 450 disadvantaged folks in this district, or there's 775. You know, we've got to create a system and a methodology. The federal government system uh, is, is subject to phenomenal abuses uh, in regard to economic disadvantage. We can go to distressed counties. That's a standard we have in Tennessee. Right. In the in distressed county, then you fall under the economic disadvantage. When you're out from under the distressed counties, then you're no longer uh, given that particular uh, financial benefit. And uh, I think the English language learners is something too easy to identify. That's clearly very easy to document. And, but that's short term, in other words, you may funnel in money, you may have an influx of 300 people all of a sudden from, uh, from one of the nations uh, in Eastern Europe. And then, boom, once you've solved that language learner issue, then you've got 300 less students. So that has that would be a flexible number moving based on the numbers. But that's easy to to uh, uh, to identify. Special needs are easier to identify. Sometimes we argue whether or not that child is receiving the specific amount of services or the quality of services. And we have lawsuits over all of that, uh, but but that's a little more easier. Uh, the economic disadvantage, unless we create, a, we need to create a methodology to make sure that money is being spent correctly, wisely, and for those folks that are in that particular category. Thank if you. We I think it would be especially within our purview as a fiscal responsibility subcommittee on this weights piece to report back to the department that they ensure that how they measure that um, for the lack of a better term can't be gamed that it it is a very clear definition 
Uh, and I know we discussed some last time and Tara, you're up next. So I'd like for you to hit on this briefly if you can, how MNPS actually does um, tier uh, some of these like English learners and students with disabilities. So you get a different amount, especially with the English learners, you're gonna get more at the front and at the front end. And as that student becomes more proficient, it backs down rather than um, staying the same uh, or just going away entirely, you know, the next year. Tara, you wanna hit on that for a second or you can ask your question or give your sure. feedback first. I I'm happy to give a 30 second elevator speech on that. But first to Representative Brooks's point, um, the Department of Education does have a very rigorous process for identifying economically disadvantaged students. They switched in 2017 to direct certified. That means that a student has to be, their family has to receive direct government assistance such as TANF or SNAP. They can also be a foster child, migrant, runaway, that sort of situation. So they have to be clearly identified in order to receive the current at-risk funding, which is for economically disadvantaged students. Title I is a little bit different and that is through the federal guidelines and there are different identifications for that. So if we wanted to look at the current formula for economic disadvantaged, I would like to point out that in Metro Nashville, it is actually an issue for us, this switch to um, direct certified. We have a large undocumented population, whether or not people want to acknowledge that, it is here and these students need a lot of support we do not receive funding through the BEP specifically for them as at-risk students because they are not direct certified. There are also a number of students to Chairman Brooks's point, their families are not going to sign up for government benefits. And so when districts, when the state chose to make that shift a few years ago, the number of economic disadvantaged students statewide dropped substantially. They made up for it in the BEP by raising the per pupil amount, but the number identified has gone down significantly from years past because of this new way of identifying students as economically disadvantaged. Very briefly about how Metro addresses it, we have a base amount of $5,000. We provide a weight right now of 5% for poverty. 24% of that, of the $5,000 goes to English learners and our exceptional education or special education students, they receive a flat amount based on the option, which is identified in the BEP. So options one through eight, they get a tiered amount of funding based on their identified option. We also have other direct allocations as well, such as you must have one principal, you know, there's a pre-K supply budget, a school supply budget. Um, certain positions are also directly allocated through the formula as well. One last comment or question, David, and then we're going to have to, to wrap up. Okay, thank you, Justin. Uh, first off, uh, I'm a businessman. I'm not a professional educator. So when y'all throw out these initials, I really don't know what they mean. So I would appreciate you not doing that. Uh, also, uh, in looking at the unique learning needs, I'm really puzzled as to why dyslexia has to be listed as a separate item as opposed to just it being a part of students with disabilities and gifted students or special ed if, if you will so the, yeah i recall at some point that that had been not brought up and then there were discussions about would would that be included and i think it might be that it was added as a separate because it wasn't initially in, in part of some of the public comment discussions, but unless somebody else has a, a a statement on that, I think that can be a recommendation that that be, especially as we're looking at potentially tiering different levels of disabilities, that that can just be folded into the students with disabilities. So yeah, and I think here on this slide, it was just, they were just, you know, trying to cover the trends across subcommittees of the, the that, yeah. that were being. That so we're I being think that to, was that previously or, not included in disabilities under the BEP? I just think there were a lot of questions about whether it, it was included. And so I think it's listed here just to note that it it has now been discussed and brought up as a topic. So I think one of our recommendations can be to fold that into students with disabilities and be considered as part of a tiered approach. 
Um, and then going back to, to Chairman Brooks' point about ensuring that these are uniformly and well-defined uh, categories for weights. Okay, uh, one other point that I had was uh, Mr. Brooks is talking about uh, these counties that are disadvantaged and I uh, think uh, someone used the term that, that uh, Dr. Fox had done some study on all of this. Is, is this uh, an item that we could get a get a hold of to see how Dr. Fox or whoever has graded each one of these counties so that we can see uh, what the outcome of those studies are. And secondly, is there any room in his studies for a county to disagree with his, his findings? We'll look at that. We'll, we'll get some answers for you on that before the next meeting. Okay, thank you. So any other, I don't think we had anything else brought up to include in the weights, which like I said, these were very consistent with what we had discussed last time. So are we comfortable recommending these weights as listed um, with tiers for English learners and students with disabilities and clear and, and uniform definitions um, across the board? Got that, Dominique? I do feel like there's still some discussion outstanding on the base uh, stuff. Perhaps for our next call, uh, we'll, we'll have a better understanding uh, of, of some of that when we see this the draft formula and can revisit that then. We did discuss several things that we suggested either be moved to direct or consider move to direct funding. So I think that'll kick off uh, uh, the discussion on what those direct items are um next time and then we'll also uh, discuss some outcomes and hopefully we'll be able to to get to our policy goals we a few of those were brought up today too that i'd like to to start to flesh out next time as well any other final comments or questions kate real quickly i think the um the the center for business um economic research and the um other way that they decide per capita versus per capita um sales tax that was all in i think the haslam report that you had attached uh, they had the 2014 haslam i read yes, you're I, correct it's referring to tasser and sieber and i do yeah. think you're correct it's in that report. perfect thank you for that anything else well, thank you for the robust discussion today. Our next meeting will be on the 18th at 1130 a.m. here on Microsoft Teams. And hopefully we'll be able to get through our final recommendations uh, on the remaining categories then. And um, we've got two more meetings left, I believe. Is that right, Dominique? So we're nearing the end, but we appreciate you all. And uh, again, if you've got snow, enjoy it. If you're getting snow, hopefully you'll get as much as we did here in Nashville. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.